Welcome to the Carrie Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I hope this episode helps you thrive in life and leadership. And if you like it, hit the like button and subscribe to my channel, and that way you'll never miss a thing. Well, if you're like me, you're always looking for ways to stay informed and engaged with the world around us. And that's why I created On The Rise. It's a curated weekly newsletter packed with thought-provoking articles and insights on faith, culture, and the future of the church and really any other subject that I find fascinating and conversation worthy. And I send it to you absolutely free every single week. So if you're ready to join the conversation and be part of a community of curious, engaged leaders, you can subscribe to On The Rise today at ontherisenewsletter.com. You can start and stop at any point on theRiseNewsletter.com. This episode is also presented by Glue. Glue is connecting the faith ecosystem in innovative ways. One way is by making it a lot easier for churches to connect with new visitors. Did you know, for example, that the time it takes for a church to respond to new visitors has a major impact on whether that new person or family will stay? Well, with Glue, you can use automation to build engaging new visitor engagement journeys. You can learn how at get.glue.us slash visitors. That's get.glue.us slash visitors. And now to today's episode. Henry, welcome back to the podcast. Well, it's good to be here. You guys are doing great things. Well, you're doing great things. I, I told you, you know, there's two ways to read a book. One is to get ready for the podcast. And another is you read the book cover to cover and yours, your new book on trust was absolutely the second for me. I couldn't put it down and I couldn't believe there was that much because I've read books on trust uh, for me to learn on that subject. I mean, I guess that sounds arrogant, but it was, it was gripping. It was really gripping and really helpful. So thank you. Well, I'm glad it was helpful. You know, (laughs) People say, you're an author? And I go, not really. I'm not an author. I'm a practitioner. <laughs> I spent a hundred <laughs> year, you know, with leaders were locked in the war rooms. And um, all I do is write about the real stuff where you see. So um, hopefully it rings through. I think the the topic, you know, all of us, whenever we've been in a problem situation or um, been called into one, at some point you're going to get to some either greater need to trust or when to withhold it (laughs) or some Mm. issue involving trust. Well, and I think it really plays at a lot of leadership too. There's so many leaders uh, and I talked to hundreds of them. You talked to so many yourself, but you know, they had an elder go rogue on them or they had somebody that they trusted uh, turn on their back or, or, you know, turn on them or backstab them. It just, it shows up everywhere. It's an issue between parents and children, between, um, well, family of origin, spouses, right? Trust. And, and this is beyond the headlines. It's just an everyday issue. Yeah. And, it, and it, the, the other thing about it, and I write about this in the book is for, for teams and companies to realize, you know, trust fuels everything. And, and having trust with your outside stakeholders and your customers and all of that, when that's really focused on, makes a big difference. So I'm kind of curious, like you, you, you said, you know, with outside stakeholders and that, is it possible to have trust with people on the outside when it's falling apart on the inside? Or do you see it as a continuous whole? Like the more solid you are on the inside and with your inner sphere, the easier it becomes with the outside. It, it, what's the connection there? Well, Certainly they are connected. That's, that's, you know, that just is, it's going to leak out somewhere. And the closer somebody is to working with an organization, you know, the, the, when you really have deeply involved stakeholders, you got investors or you've got key customers or whatever. I think in the best scenarios, you're, you're really almost one team in a way, your people are inside theirs and and vice versa. And so it, it's it's going to find its way out. And everybody goes, well, you don't talk to him about that, or you can't depend on him for that or her for that. But it's interesting, Carrie, because this is one of the big problems. Some people can be so duplicitous and be one way to the outside and actually deliver on all the aspects of trust that everybody adores him and buys into him and this and the other. but when you go inside, it's a mess. And I mean, we hear that all the time, you know, in big, you know, blow ups that 
um, that's why they have things like glass door. Right? It's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's different on the inside than the outside sometimes. Well, and I wonder if that's endemic to churches too. I mean, as you said that, I'm thinking about churches and I'm not going to name names, but where that appears to be the case. Uh, someone is wildly adored on the outside, but you get to anybody too close to it or the story comes out later that they were someone entirely different in their private life. Yeah, and and the other thing we have to remember is, is you know, humans are complex, right? And yeah. And and we have different relationships that actually pull at different parts of us. And sometimes even just take an elder board. I mean, sometimes a senior pastor can be wonderful with 90% of them, but trust is broken down with another couple because that person pulls at a different part of the leader and they're different with them or vice versa. And now you've got a division. And if, if that trust isn't, isn't fixed, the whole thing blows up. And so humans are complicated. And and one of the things about that I wanted to write the book for was that, you know, Carrie, we tend to think of trust as sort of like, you know, somebody's got integrity, right? You can believe what they say. And there is a moral foundation, obviously, to trust. If somebody lies, cheats, or steals, then, you know, you can't trust them. And, and, but a lot of times people will think, well, they have integrity. I trust them. But trust has, and this is what I did in the book, I tried to take, you know, trust is a, is a complex algorithm that happens inside the human heart and mind and soul. And there are different factors that load on getting to go when you hit the go button. And a lot of people will hit go if somebody's just honest, but we all know leaders that they're not going to lie to you, but you're really not going to trust them to go take a certain project or to take over a certain department or this and the other. And they go, well, you don't trust me. Well, no, I don't in that context because there's other factors that come into play. And for people to be trusted and really get buy-in, that's why I tried to create a little model where you can kind of check the boxes before you move forward. I'll give a classic example. You see this in churches all the time. Somebody starts a church, and they gather, they ask people to be elders because the person understands them well and understands the mission, and their motives are pure, right? And they believe in it, and they know they've got their support. Well, then you get this elder board, and this thing starts to grow, and the next level of trust, which is competency, can somebody actually deliver what I'm entrusting them to do in this context. And they're sitting there with now an organization of scale or size with complicated factors. And they can't really trust their elders with that issue because they don't have the competency. They're not bringing that competency to the party. So then what do they do? They go have a board of directors, right? That's separate. And because you can trust this group for this and this group for that, Mike could have solved that a little better in the beginning if you know what to look for. Yeah, that's interesting. We were going to touch on, I was hoping we would get to governance, but let's go there right now because uh, I see that as an issue that keeps coming up in the church. So you have large churches with no effective boards, like basically there's nobody. It's just the pastor and his or her uh, close associates running the church. You kind of have straw boards you have outside board of directors. But one of the points you really raised, and uh, I believe this was in the questions I sent to you, was the whole issue of like what happens, and I face this to a certain extent at Conexus, where the qualifications for eldership, part of that, obviously there's biblical qualifications, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like the person that, that becomes an elder has to have the ability to process some of the challenges that a church is facing. And if you get into a relatively large church, that's a small group of people that you can pull from. How do you navigate that tension when, you know, maybe some of your elders have never led anything remotely as big as the church you're leading and therefore might not be able to speak into it? Or is that is that off point? Am I just missing something no, it's not, in the way it's, I frame that? It, it is. It's not off point at all. In fact, so, you know, the, the model that I've, I've used in companies and organizations and 
in, in leadership development for years, it's got it's got some components to it. You want to check all the boxes, right? Well, well, somebody can have great competencies even. Let's go past that and make it more complicated. They can have great competencies in in running something. But then you get to the next factor, which is their personal makeup. You know, in the book I called it character, but character is way more than than honesty and integrity. Character is your makeup. Okay. If you have a character in a movie, they're gonna have an arc of how they show up in different circumstances, in different things. You know, I had a brother in law who's a Navy SEAL. I would trust him, trust his makeup to defend me against the bad guys. But if I'm going through the dark night of the soul and my dog dies and I got to cry, I'm not going to Mark. <laughs> He's a favorite, dude. You know, I'm going to one of my empathic friends, but I'm not going to trust their makeup to lead through a crisis. And so a lot of times in these situations, Carrie, you know, they picked people who have, might have competencies and maybe if you get a good HR director of a large company, join them, or a good attorney or a good business person, and they've got this, this board. But they didn't look at the person's makeup, past moral integrity. And what if that person, I dealt with this just the other day in a large um, uh, private equity firm where the leader, they're going through a crisis and they got some difficult conflicts coming at them. And he said to me, he said, one of the things I've had to learn in this from, and and we use a mutual um, attorney, he said, she is so great because if somebody's coming at me, I put on the armor and hold up and I fire back and I'm going to win this battle. He said, she's been able to modulate me through that. See, that's a that's a makeup of the person. And, and this is why the Bible talks about, for example, um, I got called into a big Christian organization one time. The CEO says, yeah, I want you to do leadership development with my executive team. And I said, okay, so I fly back there. And I said, you know, mostly I work in companies and and it's so much fun to be here because you get to talk about the spiritual side of leadership. And Kerry, I thought his hair was going to catch on fire. He goes, wait a minute, whoa, I don't need you coming here and doing spiritual development. These are godly men. These are godly men. They've been walking with the Lord for 25 years. I need leadership development. And I said, huh. are they kind of connected? He said, no, these are godly men. I need, I said, what kind of leadership problems are you having? He says, well, I can't get them to work together. He said, they, they, they guard their little fiefdom and they won't share information and resources. And, and I can't get them above it to, to work together. And I says, these are the godly men. He says, oh, they're godly men. You know? And I said, well, my Bible says that love doesn't seek its own. If you go to Second Peter 1, it talks about personal makeup in order to be fruitful. And one of those is mutual affection. So you got competency, but the makeup of a few of these people is emotionally detached, not able to understand, not able to give up things. So you got to get into the, is this person that I'm trusting, is their makeup contextually appropriate for what I'm entrusting them with? Those are really good nuances. So I want to think through the governance issue. I'm getting that question a lot these days, maybe because in part of all the moral failure we've seen in the church and the failure of boards to oversee rogue leaders inside and outside the church. But if you're putting together, let's say, let's do a church of 250 and then a church of 2000, just to pick two numbers. What are the qualities and characteristics you're looking for in elders slash board members for the 250 person church and the 2,500 person church? That are different? Yeah. Or maybe they're identical. I don't know. Well, if you just look at the trust paradigm, now all of this is, again, it's contextually dependent. You know, I just had two, two knee replacements and, uh, spine surgery. And I wrote in the book how, you know, I found some surgeons that I would trust on competency and all this and the other. But if they didn't have the other part of it, you go to Yelp and read the reviews of, of how they follow up or, you know, they don't really care after the surgery's over and all of that. So, so it's all contextual. But, but if you think about it, 
I think the elements of trust are going to be the same, whether it's 200, 2,500, or a global entity. And it starts with, does this person have the capacity to understand me and really hear and connect with what I need, what the organization needs? Can they hear it? And this, you know, you got a lot of people that think they understand, but you walk out of the meeting, they didn't get it. Because you can tell they're nodding, but they're not getting it. And and one of the, I, I talked about this one day, you know, it's deep listening and understanding. And there's a neurobiological basis to all this. We, we, the, all the way down your spinal column, people you're negotiating with, people that you're, you're, you're working with, there are going to be neurological bases for their hitting trust, the go button, that are based on how well they experiencing being mirrored. And they can tell, and to mirror somebody, you got to shut up and listen and understand. Even if they're telling you there's little green men on the roof, if they don't feel like you understand and validate that is true for them and really get that, they're not going to trust you. And I I was talking about this one day and and a guy walked up to me afterwards and he said, I'm the lead hostage negotiator for the FBI and everything you just described is our entire training program. The guy's got a bomb strapped to him. You don't walk in there and do what leaders do. They always do this. They try to persuade people into trusting their vision. Why do you want to blow the building up and kill all those people, right? What a bad thing. Mm -hmm. Exactly. They're going to talk them out of it and nobody's listening. They go in and say, so I'm, Joey, and they sent me in here to talk to you. What's your name? And and then they'll ask, so tell me, how did we get here today? What's going on? How do we find ourselves here? And they gradually start to listen and understand. And if you if you hire somebody that doesn't really get what's important to you, and that elder doesn't understand what's really important to the vision, what hurts it, what helps it, what you fear, what makes you happy. You're not, you don't have trust because they're detached from it. They don't feel it when you feel it. They don't feel what their actions do. If they go out there and start to interfere with your staff, they don't understand from where you sit, what that causes you. Okay. So, so there's a deep empathy. The second thing is motive. You know, some people, you hire them and you've got a vision, you've got an agenda or the, the board has an agenda, but they really have their own. And if they aren't for you, and everybody's got their own interests and everything, but if we don't feel like somebody's got our back and when we're not in the room, they're not. We, they're not looking out for us, then you can't really trust them. You want to be able to be able to know somebody is there not only for their own interests, but they're there because they want you or the vision to win. And that's their main motive. And so this is where you get into churches because when when you get goofy governance, you'll have people coming in with their own agendas and they might be the most powerful personality or they might have the biggest influence or whatever. And that personal agenda can train wreck the whole thing. And so if somebody didn't have the capacity to transcend their agenda, and I, I, one of the great leaders that I've ever worked with, I saw him say one day, he, he finally sat down with the guy, the number number two guy, and said, you know what? I can't have my foot on the accelerator when you got yours on the brake. And this is the guy that would have the meeting after the meeting, and they go in, and then he'd go get his own little click. So what's what's their motive? What what is the agenda here? And the third thing, can they pull it off? We talked about the competency. What well, takes certain competency to govern a church at two hundred? It takes other competencies in twenty five hundred. It takes other competencies in a hundred thousand. But the competency still have to be there. You know, if Mabel or Joey makes nice jello for the gatherings, to be an elder, you gotta do more than that, right? So yeah, so yeah. we're looking at competency. And then in the fourth one is the makeup, the personal makeup, apart from 
competency. Look, somebody can be a great surgeon. And I talked about my surgeon and the how I picked one. And and what if they have all three of the first ones? They understand my pain. The motive is they really want to help me, not just charge me and you know show me off as a research project or something. They're really competent. And then they say, if you want to, you can come watch me do one of these. And so I go in the theater and watch the operating room, and he starts to cut on people. And and then all of a sudden, halfway through, he goes, oh, crap, he's bleeding. Oh, no. <laughs> and I find out his makeup. I need somebody's calm under <laughs> crisis, right? So we get to the to the to how they're made up. And then lastly, and we do this all the time, we ignore this or don't do it right. What's their track record? And you got to look at track record contextually because because if somebody doesn't have if they if they haven't done essentially the elements of what I'm asking them to do classic example I went to a company they said our CEO needs coaching it's it's been there for a year his CEO is floundered and I said well tell me about him they said well he was our COO for. 10 years and he was incredible. Everybody loves him. He, he changed distribution chains. He changed supply chains. He, he, he redid all of our IT and our infrastructure. He's incredible. So our CEO retired and we made him the CEO. And I said, where'd he get the E? I said, what do you mean? I said, he was a COO. Now he's a CEO. Where'd he get the E? And they said, well, we promoted him. I said, he's sitting in the chair but everything you've described to me about morale and floundering and the results, and I look at his, I look at his functioning, he's functioning very strongly as an operator, but not as a CEO. And they, they looked at the track record of his work, but they didn't look at the track record of does he have the contextually appropriate competencies to do what I'm going to need. And so, it's not like we trust one person and don't trust another one. You know, my oldest daughter, when she started to drive, you know, everybody's had that experience. The first time you got the driver's permit or learner's permit and you're in the other seat, it's like, <laughs> it's like it's terrifying. It, yeah. Bring me some heroin or something. <laughs> and I remember we, you know, we got to the, we got to the first stop sign and she kind of rolled through it. And I said, Olivia, you didn't stop. She goes, she goes, dad, I know how to drive. I said, Olivia, pull over. She said, what? I said, pull over. I said, let me tell you how you'll know when you can drive. When I can sit over here and not fear for my life, I'm going to have to see a track record of what happened the last time. <laughs> last time you did this, last time I trust you. And it doesn't have to mean that they've ever not been a CEO before, but they've had to function in the ways that show us that somebody can actually do that, or we need to build it into them. And that's another thing we can do. But best predictor of the future is the past, always. And people say, well, then you can't get another start. Oh, yes, you can. You say, you know, I want to trust you in this. You haven't done this before, but we're going to do some things. Or if you've screwed up, you're, we're going to do some things. And if and as you change and develop, then we're going to entrust some things to you and entrust more, but you're still trusting in the past because now they've got a new past. The past year was different. And this gets to moral failure. It gets to a lot of other things that somebody says, I'm sorry, that's not enough. That starts the process of asking the question, do we want to restore this person and why and what will it take to get to that place? Because you're going to entrust something to somebody, it's like with a marriage when you know there's a affair or something. There's a process you got to go through. If you're going to repair that, you don't. It's not based only on "I'm sorry" and "I'll never do it again." Trust is, you know, forgiveness is free. Trust is earned, and it's got to go through some steps. So I definitely want to come back to the whole process of restoration, reconciliation, if that's possible, because I think that's a major issue. But those five criteria, I think it's five, super helpful. What a lot of people struggle with in boards, Henry, and you've seen this, is 
uh, the criticism, particularly where there's been a failure, whether that's a moral failure, financial failure, or something that didn't go right, the pastor was abusive or bullying, you hear, well, what the pastor did was uh, put a lot of yes people in place on the board, which can be the case. And those first two criteria, that ability it's to be understood. Often, and, and let me, can I bring you for a second? Yeah, please. It's often the case when the person is narcissistic. Okay, tell me more about that. Because a charming narcissistic person, the only relationship that works with somebody like, like that is someone that mirrors their how wonderful they are. Uh. And they get fed off of that. So they get, you know, kind of brought into the, oh, it's so wonderful and all this kind of stuff. And that's kind of the role they play in the dyad. And so it's 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 it takes two to do this dance, right? So not only do they have those people around them, that's the kind of people that they attract. Okay, that's so it gets super set up helpful. all the time, all the time. Right. So you have yes people on the one hand, and then on the other. And I've actually heard this. I'm thinking about elder elections we went through a long time ago, and someone said, "What you need is like a leader of the opposition on your elder board. You need someone who can critique you." And often, if you look at the autopsy after there's been a failure, they will say, "You had yes people on the board. You didn't have anyone who 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 opposed you properly." I sense you're saying neither of those is helpful. And if so, can you nuance that, explain why I'm wrong, or or perhaps why either the yes person or the leader opposition is not who you want for your board? We certainly don't want yes people. I mean, if you have that, what, I mean, if you are in a, a, Ship this. I've been in this situation. I'm coming back from Catalina Island one night at midnight with my 80 something year old parents and a bunch of guests. And, and I'm six miles offshore in turbulent seas and it's 45 degrees outside. And all of a sudden the lights went off and the alarms go off. My, my boat's on fire. Okay. And I did not. N- there was nothing I could do. I went down in the engine room and looked in the whole thing and I got it closed and I went back and I went on the radio. I'll call May Day. All right. Well, I'm out there waiting and then the fire boats are coming. You see the lights off in the distance. And when they got there and the seas are going like this and they make the determination, they got to get us into the lifeboat. I'm doing what the experts tell me to do. What if I had yes men? And I said, well, I don't like, no, I'm not going to step in that or I'm not going to do this. You don't, in a crisis, if you can't listen to people that know what they're doing, they are your safety net. The Bible says in a multitude of counselors, there's what? Safety. So if you're a leader, I, I had a great CEO client one time who fired his CFO, who was brilliant and did everything well except he said, I've never, I can't get you to tell me when I have a bad idea. He fired him. He said, I can't trust you. So the yes, if all you got is yes, people, you are in danger and you're omnipotent. Okay. And omnipotence always leads to destruction. On the other hand, you go to the personal makeup. You don't need, uh, you call it a contrarian? Leader, leader of the opposition, contrarian. The opposition. Term. Yeah. The opposition. Opposed to what? Exactly. That was my question, right? If it's like, what, what are you trying to accomplish here? Yeah. If, if their only relationship is with the word no, right? If they're just oppositional by nature, don't let them in the room. We got a vision to accomplish here. We need people that can come alongside and then oppose bad ideas as well as get behind good ideas. 
And that re- they get into the makeup here. That requires judgment and wisdom and cognitive flexibility and emotional flexibility that if they don't like something that they can, you know, we've all heard the phrase, you, you've got to debate it, right? You've got to debate it. And then it ultimately, leader says, have I heard from every, well, I don't like, no, we talked about that. And I heard you on that. Well, I still don't like, I said, no, we spent a half day on that. I've heard you. Now, can you disagree and commit? Because if you can't, I can't have you opposing me after we're all going in the same direction. So we need people with both abilities. The Bible tells us, and neuroscience and any pediatrician will tell you, a baby comes into the world only knowing two words, and that is yes and no. You do something pleasurable, you see them light up, and they go, yeah, give me more of that. I like that. And you give them something displeasurable, their little heads turn like this. They're already saying yes and no. And some people will only say yes, some people only say no. Huh. Now, what I love about your framework is it's so different because the first two uh, parts of the five parts, if it's five, are sort of, you could say, oh, are you going in the field of yes people, deeply understood, deeply listened to, but you're not. You, you're you really creating or cultivating people who love you enough to tell you the truth, which is something I think we desperately need in leadership. So they're not the leader of the opposition. Yeah. And they also, they love you enough to tell you the truth. And they also have personal access to the truth. So they don't have a lot of, blind spots, and they don't have a lot of confirmation bias where they're coming in with a viewpoint and they use every piece of data to confirm that they're right. And so they they love you enough to tell you the truth, but they actually love the truth enough to be curious enough and open enough to find it. Because, you know, in great boards, everybody's pushing against everybody and we got to hear all that. I got to hear, at least if I don't agree with it, what am I doing that gives you the perception that that's what we're doing? Because we got to solve that problem. So we got to have the freedom. You know, diversity is interesting now because people have finally started to study the science of diversity. And what we know from diversity in the research is the more diverse a group is or hits a certain level of diversity, the IQ of the group goes up. Huh. And if you, and part of diversity is not just, you know, backgrounds or ethnicity or part of diversity is diverse viewpoints and ideas. We need those. And that's why these churches and sometimes boards and companies that become a closed system, there's no diverse thought anywhere in there, even though you might have diversity on other measures. One of the things, you you probably know Tim Tisopoulos, right? I I know the name, yeah. I don't know him personally. Yeah. So Tim has been, he's the president of Chick-fil-A. You know, Truett was the founder, and then Dan was the CEO for a long time, and, and Tim is the president. He's been there since Truett, and now Andrew. And one of the things they, they they just honored him, and I I spoke at that um, a little bit to honor Tim. And one of the things I said about Tim of why why that company has grown and they're incredible in so many things they do is he always kept it and he pushed for an open system. They have used consultants and coaches and send people to you know. Harvard for leadership development or here and there, and they bring in the, you know, the Jim Collinses and all these people. And so they get diversity and they, they have their executives meet with, with CEOs of the biggest companies in America that have nothing to do with food. They're getting diversity of thinking. And that's, that's one of the main things that diversity can bring us. And if you, you just want people to agree with you, watch out, baby. <laughs> 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 yeah, it's for a, a train wreck. 
So I didn't intend to make this a complete board or senior leadership team episode, but it's such an interesting thread. I'm going to pull at it one more time before we go in different directions. One of the other critiques I hear, Henry, and I'm, I'm really curious about your take on this because yeah, we no, won't so name names. Again, you, you, you didn't mean to have it what? I didn't mean to turn this into like a whole episode on boards or senior leadership, but oh, it's just a really yeah. fascinating conversation. But one of the things I've heard quite a bit and read quite a bit is when a leader has a moral failure. So let's say it's a sexual thing. Uh, people will say, well, the board didn't do its job. And I'm not asking you to critique specific boards, but it really makes me think, I think you could have the healthiest board in the world, but if a leader is determined to hide something, that leader will find a way to hide it. Do, do you agree, disagree? Any thoughts on that? Like, can good governance prevent moral failure? I think it can curb it. I think it can bring it to a line. I think it can, we need greater accountability, but I'm just, I'm wondering, like, can you govern moral behavior away or immoral behavior away in a senior leader who's determined to do something outside the lines? Well, you know, Moses tried it, didn't work. How so? How so with Moses? I mean, he, he came out, you know, he, he came out the mountain with the policies and all yeah, this. Yeah. But if you keep reading it and all the instructions that God gave him, you also got to have a lot of provisions for when it goes south. Right. Fair. So it, Fair. Was, it wasn't like, oh, I picked the wrong leader or board. It's I equipped the leaders and the board on how to deal with situations when they occur. Now, obviously, great governance does a lot of things to prevent things from happening, and you do everything you can. But you're dealing with humans. And so the best board, look, one of the things I talked about in the book, and, and this is a problem I had in writing the book, I'm trying to equip people to know how to trust. And I'm telling you, if you look for these five things and you do them well, you will make better decisions in trusting. But I started with, but remember, bad people happen to good people. We can all get duped. We can all get duped. I mean, look at how did the smartest people these are really smart people. Give Bernie Madoff billions over a long period of time. These are not idiots. Uh -huh. I'm reading Morgan Housel's book on exactly that issue right now. You know, Bernie Madoff was a very trusted name on Wall Street and people gave them him ridiculous amounts of money and got duped there for years. Yeah. So it's not like they're asleep at the switch. This went on for a long time, a long uh -huh. time. So don't look, if you're in, in that situation or even a spouse, don't blame yourself. Anybody can get duped. There also are times when we have blinders on. Oh, now that's fair. And I, I, I'll give you a great example of this. I, I got called into a board one time that they were choosing a new CEO and the, um, the board, was, they got down to one candidate. The guy was so incredible, so charming and brilliant. And, you know, all of his, it just had everything. It was the whole package. And they were so excited. But it's the final interview where he goes before the whole board. And they asked me to come in and, and sit there and give him my feedback. And so I'm listening to this guy. And gosh, he was wowing. I mean, he so the strategy he was presenting and, and the plans and all of this. And I'm gradually kind of feeling like, Carrie, I got to go take a shower. Uh -huh. I'm feeling there's something that just feels too slick and slimy. I don't, I couldn't describe it. But then it got time to questions. And, and I, I looked at him and I said, I said, well, you know, this is a lot of great stuff. It's incredible um, in what you can bring. I said, I, I got a question. Um, can you tell us about your, maybe your two greatest weaknesses? And 
in this context of this role in this market and this organization, how those weaknesses might impact what you've got to do and kind of how you handle those and what you do with those. And he looked at me and literally it was like a blank stare. It was like, now was he dreaming up how to defend? He didn't know what I was talking about. Like, it was almost like if you could read between the weaknesses, what? what? Yeah, sorry. Why, why are you asking and, me this? Yeah. And he said, well, I said, yeah, your weaknesses. He said, well, he says, well, I tend to be, you know, I tend to be a driver and I love to push things forward and achieve. And, and sometimes, you know, people get left behind. I said, stop, 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 stop. I said, that kind of sounds like a strength to me. Tell me about a weakness and how, and it kind of got uncomfortable. Somebody kind of rescued him from the conversation. And so he leaves the board. This is our guy. I I said, stop guys, please put it in the minutes. And I said, no, because if he's never failed, you're going to be his first. Or he doesn't know what he's done to contribute to failure. You're going to be his first. Well, they hired him a year and a half later. They were just about in bankruptcy and all sorts of, because all of his grandiosity and all of that, and people that said no and correct and slow down or whatever, he wow. just wasn't trustworthy. And these were, these were good people. But to your point, how do you make a mistake like that? And these, this was a smart board, but they were in a place where they were in great need of a new leader. The founder had retired. They had kind of been stuck for a while, and they were so needing this so badly. And the greater our need, the more blind we are in seeing what's wrong because we need that person to be what they can do, but we don't see... The downsides, it's like somebody who's been lonely for, you know, Solomon says the earthquakes when 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 uh, a lonely woman or unmarried woman finds a husband, you know, she's in the same thing, you know, vice versa, that that the needier we are, we're, we're more, have more tendency to trust and hop in because we need this person so badly. And there's a lot of blind spots like that. So on that note, what... Um what should we be looking for to determine if someone is trustworthy? Because you open your book with the phrase, if someone says, just trust me, you should have warning bells and sirens and lights flashing, telling you, get away, get away, stop, stop, stop. And we've all been duped. We've all been duped. I've been duped. Other people have been duped. There's a lot of leaders listening who've been duped by bosses, who've been duped by boards, who've been duped by colleagues, who've been duped by members they trusted. So when you're looking to determine if someone is trustworthy, what do you look for? Well, what I tried to do is simplify it and give you these categories as kind of a diagnostic framework. But you've got to start with a very important point, and that is trust fuels everything, everything. I was talking to a guy on a plane. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm researching trust. And he said, well, I don't trust anybody. And I learned a long <laughs> time ago, you can't trust people. I've been, he said, you can't trust. I only trust myself. And I said, well, you're psychotic. I'm a psychologist. I ain't tell you. You're crazy. <laughs> he said, what do you mean? I said, look out the window. You're 40,000 feet. I said, did you get yourself up here? You trusted a couple of guys up there in the cockpit fly this thing you trusted somebody how you know they didn't put chocolate milk in the in the gas tank yeah you trust all the time you drove to the airport trusted people stay on the other side of the road but my hunch is you've been burned personally somewhere and there's a woundedness to that and i unpack the story and you could see how that's lived itself out he's got a very small life in some key you know relational areas and other areas, you will never build a big organization if you can't trust people. 
because that means it is going to be so small. This guy's going to be walking to New York. He's not going to be getting on a plane. The only way to scale is through the fabric of trust that's in the DNA of every cell in there. And we're wired to trust. You have chemicals that God put in your brain, oxytocin and other chemicals that start at birth and go all the way through life, that open your system up to trust. Because everybody listen to this, you've been breathing for the last 60 seconds, but you haven't been thinking about it. The reason is your system has been testing the air all the way down your spinal column, determine it's safe. But if you smelled a fume before you consciously knew it, your system would back off and go, wait. And you'd withhold trust because you determined something that wasn't right. Okay. We can't even live without trusting. So the first thing is I want leaders and people to know trust is your most valuable characteristic as a human being. It's what gets you saved. The first step is to trust, all right? A baby has got to get milk, and if they can't trust, we have to stimulate the system to trust. You'll never build anything big if you can't trust. So if trust is the fuel, you look at the subtitle of the book, we've got to know when to give it, when to withhold it, how to earn it, And what to do when it gets broken? How do we fix it and determine if it's fixable? And so that's what, that's kind of what my whole push is here. You've got to be able to trust. And a lot of people have trust muscles that are broken. Yeah. And I think even more so now than 10 years ago, Henry. So I know you've got some frameworks in the book and I'd love for you to trot them out. We already talked about the five things. If it's reiterating them briefly, that's great. But, um, you know, what do we look for when I try to determine, are you trustworthy? How do I, how do I know that the are signal you, I'm getting is say, correct? Say it again. Are, yeah. are you trusting how, me? How do you know if, if you and I were meeting, I mean, we've known each other for a number of years, but I'm like, I like Henry. He wants to do some work together, et cetera, et cetera. Like, how do I know whether you're trustworthy or not? How do I assess that? Because I tend to be a very trusting person by nature. Yeah, apart from the five, right, that we talked about. Yeah. I'd really, I'd really want, but I, let's go over me and I'd really want you, as you're talking to me, first of all, the first thing you're not going to do, because we know this is the, it is a valid and insufficient criterion. And that is, you know somebody well, and they trust me, and you call them and say, yeah, he's trustworthy, and then you sign up. Right, right. That's hey, how friend, Bernie, Mm-hmm. That's how Bernie Madoff did it. Wow. Well, so-and-so's invested with him. Of course, I'm in. Because that's a smart guy. So that's not enough. Okay, now if you call everybody and they tell you stay away from that guy, well, then that's another thing. But but hopefully, whatever you're going to trust me with, you want to sit down and start to tell me about what you need. What do you need from me? And you've got to really listen to see if you feel like, I understand. I really get it. I hear it. I resonate with it. Okay? And you feel that I care about it. But then you're going to try to vet, you know, Kerry's got his own deal here and what he's trying to drive. Am I coming in here? We'll take today, for example. Yeah. Okay. You've got a podcast and you really want to equip, you want to meet the needs of leaders. That's your, and people, that's your agenda. It is. Okay. Now, fortunately, I hope you trust this. <laughs> <laughs> that's my whole mission. All right. But I got to come on here and you've got, you're going to start. I bet you've had people on, you know, they're only there to sell a book. What I always try to do is, and when I go speak, I'll always tell the organization, I don't have a template that I'm going to just come in and deliver. I want to have a long call. I want to know what you need to drive in this session, you know, or in this 
what is your what is it you're trying to push forward? Because I'll adapt to what you need to push. Let me emphasize this. I'll emphasize that. But you tell me, okay? So that gets to motive. So you got to feel like you and I are both here to serve what you need to have happen here. And boy, pastors get duped on that one all the time. You know, unmotive. Somebody, somebody's got an agenda. And then thirdly. You know, we could just go through it. Is the competency can, there? Can, can, before we get to number three, how do you get duped on motive? Not asking enough questions, uh, believing things at face value. Because the other side of this is you could become a cynic, right? Which you're not advocating. But how do you, how do you, how do I ferret out motive in people? Well, one of the ways that you can ferret it out is when you start to, when you start to, you know, because this motive is all about interests. Like, whose interests are being served here, right? Are they for what I'm for and want to drive what I'm for in this context? Okay? So now we get into it, and you start to have a relationship where you're gradually, you know, they're understanding what you're trying to do here. And you're going to see... When you start to talk about this or that, you're going to see the, well, yeah, but what I think is important is, you know, you're going to see, you're going to start to feel this force feel that's pushing onto your agenda where it's starting to morph into, you got mission creep here. Uh So what's their intent? And motive. It's a, I struggle with those two words to know which one to use in the yeah, book. Yeah. And what are they intending to do when they open their mouth? So you start to feel that, and everybody knows that feeling, you know. And you get on a board and say, "It seems like they got an agenda here. Yeah. They're trying to push the board in a certain direction, and that's not a we direction that we have all decided on." That's a click or a little corner of right. the deal. We're hidden agenda. And that's yeah. how you get divisiveness. So we got to get into this. This is why trust takes time. Mm-hmm. Okay, that's super helpful. What about what about number three? You're moving us through. Well, the competency thing. Um, you know, we vet that in a lot of ways, but we got to feel like, does somebody have, and competency really goes to skills and ability. And, and you know, I I, <laughs> I use the example of the knee surgeon, <laughs> and I said um, he understands my pain. He's really for me. And then all of a sudden, I'm ready to sign up, and he says, "I'm really excited about doing your knee because I'm an OB gen and I've never done a knee before." I go, "Whoa!" <laughs> you know, I don't want to be your first. Yeah, and and, and, and competency. Competency is difficult sometimes because sometimes we'll over contextualize competency, meaning, oh, they've run a bank, but this is church, right. you know. Well, competency has to do with the skills that are involved, and certainly this contextual learning that they're going to have to do. You know, I remember you, you probably heard um, uh, uh, Malala, Malali, Malali yeah. speak. When he, went, <laughs> when he went from from running um, uh, Boeing, wasn't it Boeing, to GM, and he goes for the press conference, he's getting hammered. Well, you came from the airline industry. What do you know about cars? And, and he, he has that famous quote where he says, well, you know, I know a lot about manufacturing and building things. He said, and, you know, I've studied this now, and I'm getting up to speed, and you know, a car has um, two million parts. A seven forty seven has forty three million parts, and it's got to stay in the air. <laughs> so it's not. You can have people come join your staff that have run businesses or vice versa. We see that all the time. But the competencies of what the way the way they're going to have to show up and deliver, you get that. And then you got to get to some sort of look at their makeup and see if it fits what we're going to need and go through. And that only comes through vetting somebody, you know, personally in a process, outside objective vetting, all that kind of stuff that we normally do. I just want people to know what to look for. Right. 
So one of the challenges I see, and I see a lot of faith leaders make this mistake. It happens in private business, but I see it happen all the time in church world. Uh, I don't know that you use these categories, but I've always thought of personal trust. I know you use something similar in the book, personal trust versus um, competency, right? Because at the end of the day, trust is confidence. And I've seen a lot of churches say, oh, Henry, the person you got to hire, you got to hire, you know, Joseph here. Joseph's the nicest person you'll ever meet. Just a good guy. Really yeah. great. Uh, you hire Joseph. He's not competent at all. Or, you know, just. And how many people start a business or a church with their best exactly. friend? Exactly. Because like, be oh, great? we know we each other. I can trust him with my kids, yeah. with my bank pin yeah. number, the whole deal. And it turns out he's not competent. Or, you know, you hire someone who's super competent, but not a nice person. Churches, and I, I always say to church leaders, it's like, look, you're a charity, but working here is not a charity. You got to find competent people. Like if they can't balance the books, they shouldn't be in. <laughs> could, you, could you please, could you please say that loud sure. a lot? Yeah. This is a charity, but working here is not a charity. You're not just creating jobs for people, right? Like if. You know what? It, one of the things I find myself saying over and over and over to Christian organizations is because you'll always hear this, Gary. In fact, I bet you can tell me the phrase. Somebody comes in and they know how to run something and they're starting to measure some things and have some accountability, right? And then they're starting to look at people's performance and somebody at the table is going to say what? Oh, but they're such great people and they've been here for such a long time, Henry. We can't possibly let them go or hold them to account. And I mean, what else are they going to do? Because, because, because we love them and we're family. We're family here. We're family. And they'll say, you're trying to run this like a business. This is a ministry. That's right. That's right. You're exactly right. Yeah. That's the phrase. Uh-huh. Or, or like you said, you use a different word. This is a ministry. This isn't a business. Well, okay, great. So you're telling me, that God said every organization in the world can fail, ex can succeed except the church. <laughs> Is that what you're telling me? But let's get worse than that. Let's get harder than that. There is no such thing as a New Testament culture that is not a performance-based culture. Oh, wow. There's no such thing. It's got to be performance-based so it can perform to do its mission, which is to reach people and turn them in from non-performers into performers for God. But listen to this. If somebody is given a little and they do something with it and he, the master goes back and he comes back, I gave you this position, you grew it 2X, I'm giving you more because he's been faithful in this, will be given more. And then you did this, now I'm going to put you over 10 cities but the one that didn't perform, he didn't say, we're so nice and this and the other. He said, you wicked and lazy servant, why didn't you even show up and put it in the bank? I'm going to take your position and I'm going to give it to somebody who's going to perform. For example, reject a divisive person after a second warning. Anybody that doesn't produce fruit gets, gets cut off. And then the ones that are there are going to get pruned and disciplined so they can be more fruitful. There's nothing in the New Testament about God making an investment in a person and not requiring a return on the investment. Grace gives the investment, and truth requires a return on that investment. And leaders are stewards over these vineyards. And there's also no such thing as a human that's not fruitful, that is truly fulfilled and happy. They're not. And worse than that, everybody around them knows, and they're mad at the leader for, why do you enable this? Well, and that was my question. Why why in the church is that such a countercultural message among Christian leaders? Um, the vast majority, not everybody, but, you know, even that, that hot take on there's nothing non-performative in the New Testament. I mean, if you want to get blown up on social media, that's a good way to do it, Henry. You know, there'll be people who come out swinging. I just want to know why we think that we can excuse a lack of results under the mask of faithfulness in the church. I'm, I'm just curious why you think that is such a resounding message. 
Well, first thing I'd say to them, though, but if you think it's a dumb idea, then you go talk to a donor who's paying for that. Fair. Yeah. See how they feel. Okay. But I think it is a confusing message um, or can be confusing if, and, and Carrie, you know this, we've all experienced it. Look, humans, humans have a very, very, very difficult time because it is a, it is a mark of maturity to be able to integrate opposing ideas and synthesize them. The old psychoanalytic theorists called it the synthetic functions of the ego. In other words, do I have the capacity to love you and be really angry with something you're doing at the same time? Or am I a borderline personality that splits it into all good, I liked you, and now you're all bad? Or a parent or a leader that takes love and limits and separates them. And I'm going to get really, I'm going deep into theology here, if that's okay Please. for a second. Yeah. Because what you're talking about in that confusion, you are talking about the fundamental split in the universe that happened in Genesis 3. When we were under God, and Psalm 85 says this, 85 or 68, when I'm, says that in him, righteousness and mercy have met. Indeed, they have kissed. Mm. They're one and the same. Mm. And then it says in, in John, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized in Jesus. So what we had is when we had them integrated in God, we fell and we lost relationship with an integration of love and limits and grace and truth. And then he gave us, to replace the integration, he gave us the law. So now you're on a performance culture only, and that will fail. If you are all about performance and limits, your people will get worse and it will fail. The law was powerless, as Paul told us in Romans. But then grace and truth were realized through Jesus. And he comes along and he helps the non-performers to become performers. Grace is unmerited favor. We're giving coaching. We're giving support. We're giving resources. And then at the same time, we have standards of performance to help you get there. So grace comes down and elevates us to be able to meet the demands of the law, not get rid of them because you got grace. That's not the gospel, and it's not good business. I'm so glad that we took some time to nuance that, and that's why it's so hard to have these conversations on social these days because there is nuance and there is depth to it, and that's helpful. Well, Henry... One of the challenges, I've asked a number of guests, but I absolutely loved your take. You spent a good chunk of the book on it, and I would encourage people to pick it up because it is a primer, a manual on how to do this. But let's talk about uh, restoration. So when a pastor has a moral failure these days, it seems to me that culturally we have a dichotomy. On the one hand, you've got people, I mean, there is, I'm not sweet. Again, you got to split. You got to split, right? And people are like, Drive that person in the wilderness and they're never to be heard from again, not allowed to do anything, that basically they've, they've been canceled. And the other side is, oh, it wasn't so bad. And a week later, they're down the road starting a new church under a new name or they've reinstated themselves or some version of, forgive me, I said I was sorry, let's get on with it. And neither, yeah. mm -hmm. neither is a satisfaction. Or they take, they take a third of the enablers from the old camp. And yeah, a hundred percent. So you're proposing a very different route and I want to spend uh, a remaining time on that. Can you talk about what's wrong with those two camps, the dichotomy we have in our culture, and then maybe a different way? Well, you know, if, if you truly believe that somebody can screw up and never have a future, then I don't know what Bible you are reading. Mm. I just don't. But if you 
are believing that somebody can screw up and essentially, in the words of Jesus in Matthew 23, clean up a little stuff and become whitewashed tombs Mm -hmm. where they clean up the outside of the cup, but inside they're full of all of the stuff then you've lost it on the other end. We wouldn't have a Paul. We wouldn't have a Peter. I love the story of Peter. Jesus said, look, you're going to screw up. He said, no, I'm not. But then Jesus says something really interesting. He says, you're going to deny me three times, and you're going to screw up big time. But after you have returned, you will become the source of strength for many. He's here without a failure, except for probably customize his ear off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This is, an, this is an impulsive character disorder, okay? Decades later, he's writing the book on character traits. Go to Second Peter 1. Yeah, yeah. He's a new person. He is a different person. You just said something important. We're not going to trust that person. We're waiting for a new person. Mm. Now, now that's got to be, that's going to be a path. So what I tried to do in the book, this this is for marriage, it's for business, it's for church, it's for everything. There is a, and I think I put it into six, steps, right? So certainly you got the betrayal. And then somebody's got to sit down and say, will I trust this person again? Well, what's involved with that? The first step is not deciding whether you're going to trust them or not. The first step is you must heal. First, you, the victim, must heal, right? The victim victim has to heal. Has got to heal first because you will not make a good decision to go forward or not or to wait or to pause or whatever if the decision is coming out of your pain. Because in pain, there's going to be a denial phase phase maybe, or there's going to be a protest phase and a revenge phase and, and a fear phase and a despairing phase and all of that. And so, you know, you see this in marriage with leaders a lot. And the wife or the spouse is like, what do I do? Nothing. First thing is, we're going to, we're going to take care of you. We're going to heal you, or you're going to heal the team. You're going to heal the body. You're going to heal because we've got to get healthy first. And the leader who violated okay? trust has to wait until that healing takes place. Is that what you're saying? Oh, my God. Yeah. Trust. You can't, you oh can't just say, well, I gave you a month. Like, come on. When can I start? Right. Exactly. I, I'm saying that because exactly. I see that, Henry, and you've seen that too. You've seen leaders say, hey, I gave you a month. Like, what's wrong with you? I would say to a spouse. Yeah. She won't forgive me. I had an affair. Well, how long ago was it? It's a month. She ought to be over by now, right? Yeah. So, but the prop it's not just time, though. The proper things have got to happen in that context to, to help get to the healing. So then from there, once you start to heal, then you've got to, in the last part of healing, now I'm getting to whether or not you restore. Right, right. right. So the victim is, is healing and? Healing, and, and, and now they got their head above water where they can think straight, right? Then, then before you even think about it, you've got to get to forgiveness. And let me tell you what forgiveness does not mean. Forgiveness does not mean reconciliation. Forgiveness takes one person. God chose to forgive by himself when, while we were yet sinners. So forgiveness is something internally where you cancel the debt and you've given up the judgment of that is correct 
they should not have been like this. And you're grieving the fact that, well, they were. And you, that's where the healing's got to do its work. And you say, I no longer want to get back at them. I wish the best for them. And we're not even talking about reconciliation. You can never see the person again. I mean, how do you forgive a dead parent if you got to go confront them? It's the stupidest. You see, uh, you see therapists do this all the time. Well, you need to go confront your parents that you'll never be healed. But what if they're dead? Or if they're not going to respond well? If you got to, if you got to depend on an abuser to respond well to your confrontation for you to be healed, then we're all stuck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not Forgiveness everybody is something changes. you do. True. And it's a work of God's grace and deep. And here's what's interesting here. When I was doing the research on this, I put it in the book. One of the most foremost researchers on forgiveness, and, and they, they went through hmm. mounds of stuff. Unforgiveness versus forgiveness. It affects your mental health, your cholesterol levels, your immune system, ca your cardiovascular disease, your diabetes, your energy, your ability to have other, it just is everything in health and mental health. And one of the key researchers that wrote about all this, and I put a footnote in this or a paragraph in it, the way this is a PhD psychologist did all this research on forgiveness. He had to forgive the person that murdered his mother on a, I think it's a home invasion. So we're talking, we're not talking about easy stuff here, but he's talking about if you don't, if God hadn't forgiven, was he going to sit there in eternity forever? Yeah, this is a knack in With Genesis 6 saying, I wish I'd never made these humans. No, he's going to be reconciled with a bunch of them and done with the others. But he's not going to be sitting there in resentment. So you got to get there. Now, once my slate is clean, I don't have anything against this person. The against, the can't, debt has been canceled. The decrees against us, as Ephesians says, wiped out. It is finished. God is forgiven. Not everybody is reconciled or realizing or accepting or receiving or benefiting from that forgiveness. That's something that he does. So then, is it time to reconcile? Not yet. Then comes the really, really hard work. Do I think I called it pondering. You've got to ponder with help. Why would I want to trust you? You mean this person in particular, right? Yeah. Why would I want to trust the this person again? Okay. Yeah. And that's where you've got to look at what's at stake if I do, what's at stake if I don't. Because the decision to trust again gives you one of two bad options. One of them is if I don't try to put the marriage back together, for example, we lose our family. You lose everything you love about that person, the reason you were in it to begin with. So there's a lot of loss when we don't, and sometimes we have to not go back. On the other side, what if I do trust again? Then I'm opening myself up to another possible betrayal. It is a, it is a horrible choice between two bad options. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to mitigate against that and work through it. And the rest of, you know, the rest of the steps talk about how we get to go or no go. And so there's three more after that, but that's sort of Yeah, do you, if you have time, I have time because the work that the offender has to do, I thought was so, so instructive. I thought that was super helpful. Well, the first thing is, are, is reconciliation possible? Now, again, I'm not talking about future trust. I'm just talking about reconciling the relationship. You can reconcile with a pastor right. that you never give another job to. Right. Or who may never work as a pastor again. You can still reconcile. But let's yeah. look at the reconciliation step first. And can we get to a place where we can be connected again 
or not even have anything to do with each other, but you and I are okay with each other. Okay. So now you've done your work and you go to them. You're saying, this is how you've hurt me. This is what you've done to me. Now it's their turn. Do they sincerely, deeply own it? And do they sincerely, without excusing it or blaming or minimizing or whatever, do they really, really, really apologize? And do they you know, the Bible calls it godly sorrow, where there is a remorse and not a guilt. I feel so bad because to death, as Paul says, Judas had that. Bad or not bad, that's the sorrow of the world that leads to death, as Paul says, Judas had that. Do you have a sorrow that's based in love? And it breaks your heart what you did to me. That was Peter. And so now we got to see the ownership of everything they did and a deep understanding of everything they did and a remorse for it and a clear apology and a will you forgive me? Yes, I will. So now we're okay. I don't want to work with you again. There could be 8,000 reasons for that. But it partly is I don't know how I would ever trust again. And, and, And that's fine. You don't have to. But if at that point, and you're not ready to trust again until that, all these boxes get checked, right? So now you may have decided in the pondering phase that there's so much at stake here. Let's at least engage in the process. I didn't say trust. Let's engage in the process. So now what we got to get to, and this is why the trust paradigm, in my view, It just doesn't ever change. I mean, physics, the laws of physics are what they are. So now they're going to apply to the new scenario. Do they really understand what I needed and how they failed understanding me? Do they see how they didn't listen? Do they see how they were walled off to their own reality or opinion? Can they see the failures in understanding and in motive where their agenda was more important, their work was more important than the marriage, how they acted out? And you see the repentance beginning to get into a deep ownership of how they failed the five things last time. And now we're going to start to look for a process of their building competencies in all these areas, and we've got to see it. And at some point, you literally are not trusting them again. You're trusting a new person. (laughs) You're trusting their new track record. There you go. And then you got to look at this process of how they're going through it. And in, in the next section of the book, I talk about, well, how do you know if somebody's really changing? And how do you know if they're really working on it? And there's some criteria you need to look for. And they're they're very clear, but a lot of times we omit them. If you're impatient with any of these, you're going to make a mistake. It takes time to metabolize the failure. It takes time to weigh the options. It takes time to get to the table and get reconciliation okay. It takes time to see somebody, whether if I am going to open myself up to this again, to see, am I dealing with a new person that's going to change and grow in these things? It takes time to vet those things. And that's a process. So we're not talking about, we talk about restoration. We're not talking about next week. But wasn't it, you know, this was a while back, but but wasn't it Gordon McDonald that, um, you know, he had a failure and then he went through a long, what's his, and it was years later he came back like Peter, but when you have returned, you'll become the source of strength for many. That, But it wasn't next week. And remember, the best predictor of the, of the future is the past, and we got to get a new past in there. And so we're not, don't be impatient with this, but it doesn't mean somebody can never come back. Carrie, there's a reason in the 12 steps 
that it's the twelfth step that says now, having received all of this awakening and all this stuff, I'll go out and help others. And we get people that say, you know, okay, I screwed up. I'm sorry. We do our moral inventory, you know, I'm clean now, and boom, they're out there helping others, but the work is not done. So it takes time. Well, you know, I was going to say, we didn't talk about this before we hit record, but what made me so excited about your book is the only other material I had seen that was like it, particularly for church leaders, was Gordon McDonald's Rebuilding Your Private World. So he's best known for Ordering Your Private World, but... um, he wrote another book years after his restoration called Restoring or Rebuilding Your Private World. We link to it in the show notes. And he's got a section not unsimilar to what you laid out. And knowing Gordon, he went through years under someone else's leadership, a council of people, um, which really takes humility, submission, change, all those things you're talking about. You've got it so masterfully laid out in your new book that I hope it just gets picked up by anybody who runs into it. And it's a different answer than you're banished to the wilderness till you die or uh, you're back in business next week, both of which seem to be the dominant narratives in the church these days and neither of which is helpful. You know, one of my favorite verses is, and I I don't know where it is, but it says, but God who always makes a way back for the one who has been banished. Oh yeah, well, that is. You know what? I, I've I've highlighted that. It's Old Testament. Yeah, it's in the buried. In but the, it's just beautiful. It's so say, beautiful. It's just. I mean, that's who he is. But he, but he'll reject an divisive person after a second warning. And wasn't I don't know exactly, but didn't wasn't Paul? Wasn't it like fourteen years? He was all square that are unaccounted for. Yeah. Yeah. When he was. Yeah. There's a 14 year gap between his conversion and his ministry. 14 years. And this is the guy that wrote the love chapter. This is the guy that. He would have written the hate chapter on year one. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. How to go get him. (laughs) Yeah. How to go get him. How to exterminate him. We were killing Christians. Now let's go kill the bad guys. Right. Yeah, exactly. We'll kill all the Pharisees. It's like, no, no, there's another way. No, I'm really grateful. I think this is so important and everybody is struggling with trust. Henry, this could be like a uh, a five-hour episode. Is there anything we haven't touched on? Like for the person who uh, is too quick to judge or those who like that seatmate on the airplane don't trust anybody, anything else you want to touch on? Well, we don't have time to really unpack it, but but, you know, we, we've been talking a lot about false positives. So we make a decision to say yes, and we were wrong. But yeah. we're broken on the other side, too, that a lot of times we don't trust when we should. I got the story in there of, a, you know, two guys that built a business, and it was time they could get to incredible scalable levels, but they had to take in, um, you know, some outside money and, one of the partners said no. And sometimes that's the right answer. There's reasons for that. But in their instance, everybody agrees the right right thing to do. But he was so afraid of being controlled. Losing control. Losing yep. control. That he couldn't do it. And we got into it. It was really, I don't want to you know, play shrink here. It was all about his father. It wasn't about his partner. It wasn't about the private equity firm or the VC firm that was coming alongside them. And sometimes we have a wounded trust muscle. So everybody's got, you know, the Bible says log out of our first eye first. Then we can see clearly to judge and evaluate others. So our trust muscle can be broken in either direction. And all of us, it is in both directions. Probably we have a tendency to hit yes too soon based on certain characteristics. There's certain things we don't like. And so we hit no too soon. And we can be broken, you know, in either way. And then the last thing I would say is this. The, the subtitle is when to give it, trust, when to give it, when to withhold it. But the third one is, and these aren't priorities, the third one is how to earn it. So you can't see what you're not. It's the most narcissistic people and the most 
mirroring of narcissists, they get caught up. If we aren't trying in our own, however we're being spiritually and leadership formed and all of that, if we're not first trying to become the most trustworthy we can be, and we all have some place to work on that, then you're going to miss it. And also, your business is only your church. It's only going to grow to the extent that you're trustworthy because trust fuels investment. And people, what's going to be worse than having somebody with one foot in? We want people with two feet in. They're only going to have two feet in if they feel and experience that it's trustworthy. And so we got to work on ourselves. Uh, Henry, I'm so glad you went there and that you wrote a significant book on it. It's going to be on my reread list. I just think it's something so foundational and increasingly rare in the world. Trustworthy people and trust seems to be a rarefied commodity. Henry, the book is called Trust. Is it called Trustworthy? The copy I had had worthy in brackets, yeah, but it's, um, no, it's, it's just it's called sort Trust. Of like, you know, when <laughs> we wrote Boundaries, they're adding all these nice well, for, I go, look, you know, the book's about boundaries. Let's just call well, it. I have a rare, <laughs> I have a rare copy then with the wrong title, which is awesome. Yeah, sorry they, and, sorry they did that. No, that's all right. That's all right. It's called Trust. Uh, it's available anywhere books are. And if people want to track with you, where are you active online these days, Henry? Uh, probably the most active right now um, on Instagram and, uh, you know, the social stuff. Um, I was doing a daily podcast in a call-in podcast during COVID. And then I got I calling that. again. And so I had to abandon it. It was so much fun. Um, but now we're trying to figure out, well, what's the new cadence I can actually do? So you, you know, if, it, if you go to Instagram, um, but one, one of the things I would suggest, go to, go to boundaries.me and check that out. There's over a hundred courses on there um, that I've filmed on all sorts of little topics um, and then, uh, lead TV is a full on leadership university is what I call it. The people who work with their teams and organizations. Well, Henry, thank you for being so generous with your time today. I'm looking well, forward to hanging you, out Karen. in real life. I just appreciate, um, the, you know, talked about the, the coming together. I think we, we kind of both care about this stuff and, and I know the people that, that listen to you they're listening for because these are real things man i mean people oh, yeah. if you go face into this maybe when they leave the room and talk to their spouse or their elders and this is where the pain is and so thanks for for giving us some attention well thanks for making a, a real helpful contribution henry till next time thank you thank you carrie